Welcome to our total joint replacement class. I am Patty Paytash and have been teaching total joint replacement patients about their surgeries for close to 30 years. You might say it's a passion of mine. You have made a big decision to schedule joint replacement surgery. We strongly believe that a well-prepared patient is our best team member. Studies show that when a patient knows what to expect, they are going to better participate in their care and have a better outcome. Along with the patient guidebook and the Wellby Care Path, this class will help to get you ready for this journey. Here's the outline of what we will be discussing today. Class is designed to provide you information from different points of view. Some of it is repeated on purpose. If it is repeated, it's probably pretty important. Amy Berger will review with you some of what your surgeon has discussed with you. When you were in the office, you probably only heard half of the discussion, so Amy will review this information from a provider perspective. Social services will discuss discharge planning and advanced directives, and I will return to walk you through your patient journey. Hi, this is Amy Berger. I'm a physician assistant with the orthopedics department at Memorial Medical Center. I will help navigate this virtual joint replacement class along with others. So here we go. Arthritis, what is it? We can start with breaking down the word itself. Arth means joint, itis means inflammation. So in other words, simply put, my joint hurts. There are many, many types of arthritis. Osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic, gouty, Limes. Some are obviously more common than others. The Arthritis Foundation has published that there are 350 million adults worldwide that suffer from some type of arthritis, with 50 million of those in the U.S. Osteoarthritis is by far the most common. Each type of arthritis manifests in a different way. There are some pictures on the slides that help illustrate this. For example, osteoarthritis, the articular surface of the cartilage is thinned and worn away, whereas rheumatoid arthritis, the bone itself is eroded and the synovial tissue is abnormal. I will primarily focus on characteristics of osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis can affect people of any race, gender, age, or geographic location. Osteoarthritis is degenerative with local symptoms as opposed to some arthritis disease processes which affect the body system-wide like rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis. Generally speaking, pain is relieved by rest. Classically, morning stiffness will occur that improves throughout the morning hours. Patients may also describe stiffness that occurs after prolonged sitting. Patients can also have a deformity, something called varus or valgus, where they may have more severe arthritis on the inner or outer compartment of their knee, or a hip joint that has shortened in length due to the degenerative nature of osteoarthritis. Now that we've discussed some characteristics of osteoarthritis, what would this look like for a patient? This is what a healthcare provider would call the subjective information. This is the details that we gather in a clinic visit from you or your loved one's perspective. You may have been asked about where the location of the pain is, whether it's in your groin, your thigh, your knee, or shoulder. We may have asked details about the intensity of the pain, whether it wakes you at night. Likely there were other questions gathering information about your loss of function, whether you've had to give up things socially because of your pain, whether you've had less ability to walk distances, whether or not you've developed a physical deformity of the extremity, and likely specific questions about treatment methods that you've attempted to treat your osteoarthritis. Now we'll transition to the objective portion. These are the physical details that a healthcare provider would gather during the physical exam portion of a clinic visit. The healthcare provider would physically inspect the appearance of the joint, 
manipulate it for assessment in strength, range of motion, and stability. Additionally, there may be information provided from prior operative photos, if any, and x-ray. The information gathered from the subjective portion, the history taking, as well as the objective data obtained from the physical exam are critical in making our diagnosis and our treatment plan. In summary, osteoarthritis is by far the most common type of arthritis and why the majority of people seek joint replacement. You have made a collaborative decision with your friends, your family, your surgeon, and your primary care provider for joint replacement surgery. Now we'll discuss arthroplasty. So again, what does that word mean? If we break it down from the previous slide, arth again means joint, plasty means reconstruction. So together it's the surgical reconstruction of a joint. The surgeon replaces a rough and worn away painful surface to one that's smooth and gliding. The new artificial joint surface is made of metal or ceramic and plastic. The products used today have come a long way from the early days of arthroplasty. Historically, early attempts in the 1890s used ivory, pig bladder, nylon, or even glass for their prosthetics. As arthritis has affected millions worldwide, there has continued to be great innovations in the products themselves to improve upon wear and functionality. Joint arthroplasty remains one of the most successful surgical procedures globally. Next, I'd like to discuss the benefits of total joint surgery. This is the good stuff. This is why you've signed up and why you've had those hard conversations with your friends and family previously. Getting you back to what you used to do is the theme of our guidebook and our goals for your recovery ahead. Ultimately, we would like to improve your quality of life by decreasing your pain, restoring alignment, increasing mobility, improving your sleep, and decreasing possible medications that you may be on for your osteoarthritis. However, we can't talk about benefits without giving the risks some time as well. As with any surgical procedure, there are risks involved. The risks for each of these is low, but not zero. And again, with the innovation of joint replacement surgery, we're trying to improve upon these all the time. Your surgeon likely spent some time in the clinic visit with you discussing these risks, but the ones I'd like to touch on today include postoperative infection, blood loss, blood clots, anesthesia-related risks, and continued pain. This, of course, isn't a complete list. We will give you some information on how to best minimize those risks later on in this discussion. How does one prepare? We've now gone over the benefits and the risks. What else can you do to prepare yourself or your loved one for surgery? First of all, you can definitely take some credit for attending this class. The information that we've included is intended to help you prepare mentally for what's ahead. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, find a dependable and supportive friend or family member to designate as your coach. Your coach will encourage you with each step of the way and also help keep you organized. Total joint surgery is a major event in your life, and recruiting some good, dependable help is key. Next, read the guidebook, and then reread it. Take notes if necessary, write down questions or concerns. It gives a nice overview of the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative course. Lastly, for those that are working, or for those coaches who are working and will need to take time off in relation to this surgery, uh, please submit your work-related paperwork as early as possible. Fill out what you can on the form, especially your name and contact details. Another major goal in surgical preparations is optimizing the patient preoperatively. This includes seeing your primary care provider. Your primary care provider will set you up with a preoperative history and physical visit, or H&P. During this visit, they will discuss other medical conditions besides your osteoarthritis, if any. They will also discuss any necessary blood work and testing that needs to be performed preoperatively and make sure your medication list is up to date and accurate. One could use the analogy of getting a multi-system check of your car before a road trip. It can help decrease unnecessary stress upon you or your providers, any duplicate tests, and improve overall patient care and outcomes. These efforts all help to reduce those surgical risks I discussed earlier. 
some items that the patient can take charge of, weight loss, quitting smoking, low impact exercise, and a good healthy diet. Most patients and their coaches have lots of questions about the expected recovery time postoperatively for your total joint. Of course, your surgeon likely discussed these preoperatively with you so that you have a good idea of what to expect. However, in general, most patients are back to regular activities at 12 weeks, some sooner and some later, depending. You will be seen at a two-week interval, six-week, and three-month postoperatively, and will be given advice at each of those visits on when you can return to some activities. Prior to your first postoperative visit at two weeks, we would like the patient to avoid driving. Specific concerns about when the wound can get wet, as well as traveling, can be discussed one-on-one -on -one with your healthcare provider or staff. Additionally, many recovery questions can be addressed in the guidebook and in the discharge instructions provided to you from the hospital. As I've mentioned a couple of times previously, we are trying to improve upon the patient experience of total joint replacement all the time. One way that you and your coach can help is by providing feedback. There will be several opportunities for the patient and or their coach to provide information that can lead to improvements on a future patient's experience. This likely is in the form of a survey or through our WellBe app. Lastly, the patient may be asked to complete a PROM, Patient Reported Outcome Measure. This provides data from the patient's point of view about how their function postoperatively, their total joint, is currently, so that those data points can be collected and compared nationally and internationally. Thank you again for completing this portion of the virtual class for joint replacement. Take care and good luck with the hard work ahead. Hi, I'm Abe and I'm a social worker. Primarily what I work on is discharge planning and making sure folks have what they need to be safe at home. When you come for surgery, me or one of the other social workers will check in with you to make sure that you have everything that you need to be safe, prepared, and successful at home. As you prepare for surgery, there's a number of things that you want to have in place. One of the most important things is having a primary support person once you get home. Whether you're having a knee, a hip, or a shoulder, you're gonna to wanna to have somebody who's there to help you out with things. Primarily, you'll be doing a lot of resting and taking it easy so that your body has time to recover after surgery. Having somebody who can be there for you will be tremendously beneficial. Just about all of our joint replacement surgeries are same day discharges, which means you'll go home the same day you have surgery. So your support person should be somebody who can drive you to surgery drive you home from surgery and can also stick around through most of the day so that they can be there to watch you work with the different disciplines such as physical therapy and occupational therapy and be present during discharge education so that they can ask any questions and know what you should be doing when you get home. Equipment is another important thing to have lined up before you come for surgery. If you're having a knee or a hip you're going to be using a front wheel walker for about four weeks after surgery. Bring that with you when you come for surgery so that when you're working with physical therapy, you can practice with it and make sure it's sized appropriate for you. If you think you might be using a cane or you plan on using one, feel free to bring that too and it can be sized for you. Other things that folks find helpful are grab assist devices, toilet seat risers, commodes, sock aids, and long handle shoehorns. You'll also wanna prepare your home prior to surgery so that it's easy to get around. If you can stay on one floor of your home, that's preferred. But if you have to go to a second floor or there's a lot of steps to get into your home, that's all right. Hand railings are a great way to stay safe, as well as having your support person when you navigate those stairs to help make sure that you're staying safe and doing what you need to do. There are a number of ways to get the equipment that I've talked about. As you'll likely only need it for a short period of time, you can rent one or borrow one from a friend or relative. There are a number of places in Ashland that you can rent or purchase these things, and you probably know something in your own area. If you feel like you might have it for long term, you can certainly purchase them. Or, if you're interested in seeing if a walker can be covered by your insurance, let staff know at any time and we can explore that option. Another thing to consider while you get ready for surgery is having a power of attorney for healthcare document. Now many of you may have those, and if you do, 
feel free to bring that in and we'll put it on file with us. If you haven't completed one and are interested in learning more about it, let staff know at any time and we can look at options on how to get you more information and possibly work on completing one with you. One of the best ways that we can all work together to make sure that you're successful after discharge is to complete your home assessment tool in Wellbe. It may only take a few moments of your time, but it is a tremendous amount of information for staff to know what your home setup is like, if you have any questions or concerns, and we can make sure that we can address those prior to surgery to make sure that you're well prepared. And remember, if you have questions at any time, don't hesitate to let someone know. We want to make sure that you feel as comfortable, safe, and prepared as you can be to discharge after surgery. Following your hip replacement surgery, you will need to follow the hip precautions, generally for six weeks. The precautions are not bending forward more than 90 degrees, not twisting your leg in or internal rotation, and not crossing your leg over midline, crossing at the knees or ankles. Getting in and out of bed, it is important to follow your hip precautions. To get into bed, you will use your walker back up until you feel the bed against the back of your legs. Slide your surgical leg out in front a little. Reach back for the bed with one or two hands. Keeping your shoulders back, slowly lower yourself to the bed. Then, keeping your knees and toes pointed to the ceiling to avoid twisting in, you will pivot as you bring your legs onto the bed. Once you are centered in bed, you will slowly lower yourself to your back. Getting out of bed, you will reverse the process. Raise up onto your elbow or hands, pivot your body, keeping your knee and toes pointed to the ceiling. Slowly lower your legs off the bed. As your feet touch the floor, keep your shoulders back to scoot to the edge of the bed. With at least one hand on the walker, stand up, keeping your shoulders back. After hip replacement, you'll have hip precautions that you'll have to follow for six weeks, and that will limit you in your ability to dress yourself because you won't be able to lift your leg up to reach your foot or bend down to your feet. One tool that can help you with dressing is a reacher. So a reacher is like an extension of your arm to reach your feet and get your pants started. How you use it is you pinch the edge of your pants, bring it down to your operated leg, work it over your foot, and pull it all the way up to your knee. And once it's to your knee, you can grab onto the top of your pants and then work your other leg into it and pull it up as far as you can while you're in sitting. And to pull it up over your hips, you'll stand. And while you're in standing, you'll want to alternate your hand support on the walker to keep your balance. So you'll hold the walker until it's over your hips. And then to pull it down, you would do the same thing, alternating your hand support on the walker, sitting down, and then taking the reacher to take it off and over your feet. So that's the reacher. Another tool you can use to get dressed is a dressing stick, which is similar to the reacher, except it doesn't have the clip to open and close the end of it. You use it by putting the dressing stick down the pant leg, using the stick to bring it down to your foot. Pull it over your foot using the hook until you work it up to your knee where you can grab it, put your other leg in, and do the same process to pull it up, your, up over your hips. To take it off, you push the pants down over your feet, not bending your hips forward, and hook the pair of pants to bring it to yourself. Another tool you can use after a hip replacement is a long-handled shoehorn. So what this helps you with is get, getting your shoes on without having to bend down to your feet. You put it in the back of your shoe, slide your foot in, keeping the back of your shoe up until your foot is fully in the shoe. And the best thing to do is to have shoes without shoelaces so you don't have to bend down and tie them, otherwise you'll be having to ask for help to tie them or have them pre-tied before you put them on. 
Another task that is difficult after a hip replacement is getting your socks on. So this is a sock aid. You use it to get your socks on after a hip replacement. You take the sock and you push it on the sock aid until the end of the sock is fully up against the sock, the end of the sock aid. You then use the strings of the sock aid to bring it down to your foot to not break your hip precautions by keeping your hips open and wide. And you gradually work the sock and sock aid over your heel until the sock is completely on. And if you're gonna take it off, you would use the dressing stick or the reacher. This is another sock aid that we use for compression socks that your surgeon might recommend for you. Those are the tools you'll use after a hip replacement. Getting in and out of a chair after your hip replacement, you will use your walker. It is important to follow your hip precautions during transfers. To safely sit down, you will use your walker to back up until you feel the chair on the back of your legs. To ensure you do not bend your hip more than 90 degrees, move your surgical leg forward. Reach back with both hands for the chair, keeping your shoulders back slowly lower. To stand up, you will scoot forward to the edge of the chair. Straighten your surgical leg a bit so your hip does not flex more than 90 degrees. Use your arms to push yourself while you stand straight up, keeping your shoulders back. How to safely transfer into the tub shower after your hip replacement surgery. This is called a shower chair and would work best in the walk-in shower. It might be most beneficial when you feel somewhat unsteady or if you're going to fatigue before you complete your shower. This is called the tub transfer bench or extended tub bench. This will be beneficial for when you are not able to safely step into your tub shower and may fall by doing so. Grab bars are very important as well for your safety. There are different types such as permanent ones like this or ones that clamp on the tub ledge like this. Ashley is now going to demonstrate how to get into your tub shower. She's going to walk into the bathroom and as she gets close to the tub chair, she's going to turn around and back up until she feels the tub bench against the back of her legs. She's going to put her operated leg in front of her and reach back, holding on to the tub chair with one hand and grab bar with the other, making sure not to bend forward as she lowers herself down. Without bending forward, she's going to move her walker out of the way a little bit. Then she'll scoot back, and as she leans back, she's going to swing her legs into the tub. She will then scoot to center herself on the chair. Once she has completed showering, she reverses the process to get out. She scoots closer to the edge of the tub, and as she leans back so as not to bend her hips too far, she'll swing her legs out. She's then going to scoot, keeping her hips extended to get to the edge of the chair. Then she'll reach for the walker and pull it toward her in preparation for standing up. When she's ready to stand, she puts her operated leg forward, one hand on the grab bar, one hand on the shower chair, and without bending far forward, she stands up. And once able, will then grab the walker to walk out of the bathroom. Practicing stairs will be another activity before returning home. We teach the sequence up with the good, down with the bad. If you have one railing, you can perform stairs with one railing and one cane. To go up the stairs, you lead with your good or non-surgical leg, followed by your surgical leg and cane, one step at a time. Your stronger leg helps pull you up the stairs. To go down the stairs, you lead with your cane and your bad or surgical leg followed by your stronger leg. Your stronger leg helps control you lowering. It is most safe to avoid using a walker on stairs because the four legs are unstable. If your railings are close together, you can use two railings to go up and down the stairs. Always use the sequence up with the good, down with the bad. Following your joint replacement surgery, you will use a walker for getting around. A walker is the correct height. When you're standing up tall, arms resting by your side, you want the handle of the walker to be about wrist level. Therefore, when you're holding onto the walker, you have just a slight bend of the elbow. 
Unless otherwise instructed by your surgeon, you will be weight-bearing as tolerated after your surgery. This means you could put all of your weight through that leg if it's comfortable, but you do want to limit the weight through your surgical leg to control the pain and swelling. When using the walker, you'll advance one foot in front of the other and use your arms to take weight off of your surgery leg for comfort. To perform a straight leg raise, lie on your back. Bend your non-surgical leg up to protect your low back. Keeping your operated legs straight, do a quad set and lift your legs six to 10 inches off of the mat. Try to keep the knee as straight as possible throughout the exercise. Slowly lower your leg back down. This exercise will help you strengthen the muscles needed for bed mobility and walking. To perform a short arc quad, lie on your back. Place a small rolled towel under your operated legs so it is slightly bent. Lift your heel up off the mat by straightening your knee completely. Make sure the back of your knee remains on the towel roll. Pause, then slowly lower your heel back down to the mat. This exercise is very important to increase and maintain the strength of your knee. It is also beneficial to improve your knee control when walking. To perform a quad set, lie on your back with your operated legs straight. Your non-surgical leg may be bent for comfort. Push the back of your knee down into the mat by tightening the quadricep muscle on top. Hold the contraction for five seconds, relax the muscle completely, and then repeat. This exercise is very important to increase and maintain the strength of your knee. It's also beneficial to improve your knee control when walking. To perform hip external rotation, lie on your back with your legs slightly apart. With your operated leg, turn your toes and knees outward. Hold this position for three to five seconds, then relax, returning your toes to pointing up. Make sure not to rotate your toes inwards. To perform a heel press, lie on your back with your knee slightly bent. Dig your heel down into the mat as if trying to bend the knee. Note that your leg does not move while you dig in, just contracts in place. Hold for five seconds, then relax completely. You should feel the muscles in the back of your thigh tighten. This exercise helps strengthen the muscles in the back of your thigh. To perform heel slides, lie on your back. You may bend your non-surgical side for comfort. Bend your operated leg by sliding your heel up towards your buttocks while keeping your heel on the mat. This will cause your hip and knee to bend. Slowly lower your leg down until it is straight. This helps maintain the range of motion of both the hip and knee joints. This short video is an introduction to Welby. We can't stress enough how important being prepared for surgery is, and Welby helps you with this. In addition, if you are signed up for Welby, you will receive emails that check in with you and collect information about your condition. These short questionnaires will help us to understand how you are doing when we can't speak with you. We are truly committed to providing the best possible care to all of our patients. Let's watch the video. Welcome to your journey of care. As part of your journey, your doctor is providing you with this online tool because it is specifically designed for patients like you. It is an easy to use online support system that allows you to partner with your care team to manage your healthcare needs. Let's take a look at how your online tool will work. First, you or your caregiver will receive an email inviting you to access your healthcare tool. One important thing to remember is that you can access your tool across multiple devices, such as your smartphone, tablet, laptop, or desktop computer. Next, you'll click on the provided link to activate your account. To protect your healthcare information, you will be prompted to create a password for your account. After you have chosen a password that meets all the criteria, you are ready to log in and get started. Once you have logged into the tool, you will begin with a quick online orientation. It will provide you with helpful information, such as an introduction to your care team, the opportunity to tell us about yourself, steps on reviewing important information. Although not mandatory, we highly recommend you go through the orientation to make sure you get a full understanding of this tool and can start off strong on your journey of care. Once you have activated your account, logged in, and gone through the orientation, you will be ready to begin your journey. Here are some of the things you can expect from this tool. 
reminders to keep you on track, education materials throughout your journey, check-in surveys to engage with your care team. This tool was designed with you in mind and to make sure you reach your health care goals. Your care team looks forward to helping you on your journey of care. This is a closer look at the basic Welby screen. You can navigate the educational topics when prompted to, but also access the library or your progress report to see topics again or to work ahead. You can see your care team members and learn about their role in your care. You can keep track of your progress by clicking on the I Got It button on the bottom of each page. It will show up as completed on your progress report. Wellbe is a very valuable tool in our toolbox. If you have computer access and an email, I can't stress enough how important it is that you use Wellbe. Let's move on in your journey. There are unexpected events in life that may cause you to postpone surgery, such as weather or illness. Should this happen, contact your surgeon's office as soon as possible. If it's the day of surgery, call perioperative services at 715-685-5304. They're staffed at 5.30 in the morning and can take the message. These instructions are also in your guidebook and on Welby. The day before surgery, a nurse from pre-admissions will call you with your arrival time. They will review your final instructions about where to come, what medications to take in the morning, and answer any last-minute questions. Be prepared for this call by having your medication list ready and writing down any questions you may have so the nurse may answer them. There are loads of things that we can do to try and decrease infection risks for our surgical patients. First, monitor yourself for cold and flu-like symptoms. We want you as healthy as possible for your elective surgery. Your body is about to go through the stress of surgery and does not need to be run down fighting an infection. We've also screened you for MRSA, a bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. It is very hard to treat and can cause problems for joint replacement patients. If a patient is positive for MRSA, we know we need to treat that patient a little differently to prevent infection. We have also given you some instructions about showering and using special washcloths that will protect your skin and kill bacteria. More on that in a moment. On arrival to the hospital, your admitting nurse will also swab your nose with an antiseptic that kills bacteria for up to 12 hours. However, the number one way to prevent infection is by hand washing and using hand sanitizer. You should wash your hands frequently and every caregiver should clean their hands before caring for you. You have been given antibacterial shower gel and chlorhexidine washcloths. You should follow the detailed instructions carefully about showering and applying the washcloths both the evening before surgery and the morning of surgery. Once you have started this process, you should not apply anything else to your skin. No powders, lotions, deodorant, anything. Please note, you should not shave your surgical site for at least one week prior to surgery. Shaving causes small abrasions on the skin that can cause infection. After showering and using the wipes in the evening, be sure to put on clean pajamas and get into a bed with clean sheets. If you have pets, please do not allow them to sleep with you on this one night. The goal is to reduce any extra bacteria on your skin. It is natural to be nervous, but try to get some good rest. After midnight, it is important to not eat or drink anything. This includes no chewing gum, sucking on hard candy, or using any tobacco products. All of these things can cause your stomach to fill up with digestive fluids, and this is very dangerous when receiving anesthesia. If you have done any of this, your surgery will be canceled by the anesthesia provider. The only exception to this is to take the medication that your primary care provider instructed you to take with only enough water to get them down. The morning of surgery, repeat your skin prep at home as instructed. Put on clean clothing, take your normal prescribed medications as discussed before with just enough water to get them down and come to the hospital. 
When you come to the hospital, you will want to bring only the basics. For registration, they will require your ID and your insurance cards. Packing your bag, please bring loose fitting clothing, slip on shoes or slippers, a medication list, bring your joint replacement guidebook, we will refer to that. Also, any toiletries that will make you comfortable, your front wheeled walker, a cell phone charger, and if you use hearing aids or glasses, certainly bring those things along with you. I'm one of several nurses who will call you before surgery from pre-admission testing. During this call, we will focus on reviewing your medical history. This will be our opportunity to go over your medication list, so please have all of your medications, dosages, and how you take them available for this call. The nurse will review preoperative instructions and answer any questions you may have. We will also confirm special needs to help personalize your plan of care. When you arrive at the hospital, you will register first. They will apply a wristband and send you over to the surgery waiting room where a nurse will escort you to your preoperative room. Your admitting nurse will have you change into a hospital gown, give you a warm blanket, and prepare you for surgery. Your nurse will check your vital signs, review your medication list and allergy list. Consents will need to be signed as well as any other further testing or evaluations. Many tasks like an IV and pre-op medications will also need to be completed. Welcome to pre-op. This is where you'll come on your day of surgery. At this point, a registered nurse will greet you and escort you to your own private room, where you may be accompanied by a person of choice, most often a significant other family or friend. You'll be asked to provide two patient identifiers such as your name and birthday. You may have visitors but we ask that you keep it to a maximum of two and not any younger than 13 years of age. During this phase of surgery a consent form for the procedure you will be having will be signed and witnessed. You'll be interviewed for any additional information that may have changed after your pre-admission. Your vitals will be taken and you'll be provided with a gown, robe, anti-slip socks, and a comforting warm blanket. Any pre-op medications that were prescribed by your surgeon will be given at this point, and an IV will be placed. One of our anesthesia providers, who is responsible for your airway during your procedure, will also meet with you here and do an additional interview and assessment to best optimize your individual care in the operating room. You will also have a visit from your surgeon if you should have any additional questions and mark your surgical site prior to being transferred to the OR by your circulating nurse. Your circulator, also a registered nurse, will obtain a handoff report from your pre-op nurse and visit you in your pre-op room to ask standardized questions and confirm your surgical procedure before transporting you to the operating room. The circulator is responsible for supervising your care and safety in the operating room during the surgical procedure. An IV or intravenous line will be placed and remain until your discharge. It will deliver fluids, medications, and antibiotics and be attached to an IV pump. If you notice your IV site is swelling, leaking, or has pain, please call your nurse to evaluate for any problems. I mentioned that warm blanket. We have warm blankets nearly everywhere in the hospital for good reasons. Not only does a warm blanket feel good, but keeping you warm has other very important benefits. Warm patients metabolize medications better, have decreased risk of infection, as well as decreased risk of bleeding. So if a fresh warm blanket would feel good, please don't hesitate to ask for one. Prior to surgery, your anesthesia provider will come to see you. They will review your medical and anesthesia history with you. Be sure to let them know of any issues either you or a family member have had with anesthesia or surgery. Together, you and that provider will come up with an anesthesia plan that is right for you. If you have any specific questions about anesthesia, this is the time to get them answered. Most joint replacement patients receive a spinal block. A spinal block numbs the lower part of your body, but this does not mean that you will be awake during surgery. You will also be given sedation so that you nap during surgery. Benefits of a spinal block would include decrease in bleeding, decrease in risk of blood clots, people are more relaxed and comfortable immediately after surgery. Also, you continue to breathe on your own. You do not receive a breathing tube. 
if the spinal block does not work or you are not a candidate for a spinal block, general anesthesia is the type of anesthesia you will receive. This is complete unconsciousness during surgery. It starts with IV medications, followed by inserting a breathing tube and monitoring you throughout the entire time. When the surgery is done, the breathing tube will be removed. Related to anesthesia and pain control is the periarticular injection. In layman's terms, this is a three-day local anesthetic. At the end of surgery, your surgeon will inject a long-acting medicine around your joint to help with pain relief. This has resulted in much better pain control for our patients. Your surgeon will stop by and visit with you the morning of surgery, ask if you have any last minute questions. He will also put his initials on your operative site. Your circulating nurse will visit with you prior to surgery as well. This is a registered nurse who will review your chart and make sure everything goes smoothly throughout the surgical case. She will also escort you to the recovery room when surgery is all done. Your circulating nurse will direct your family to the lobby where they can wait for you. Your surgeon will look for your family there after surgery to update them on your condition. This is one of our operating rooms. As you can see, there is lots of equipment in the room. It's also kind of a chilly room, so when you get there, your circulating nurse will help you onto the operating room table, offer you another warm blanket, and start applying some monitoring equipment. This is the operating room. You are accompanied to the OR on a stretcher by a registered nurse. Once in the operating room, the anesthesia provider and nurse will help to transfer you to the operating room bed and cover you with a warm blanket. The anesthesia provider will then administer medications. For your safety, a belt will be placed over your thighs or abdomen. After the procedure, you are taken to the post-anesthesia care unit called PACU by the nurse and the anesthesia provider. When you look around the operating room, you will see some staff members. They will be wearing some suits that look like space suits. These are called the Charnley suit, meant to help protect you and the staff members. When surgery is all done, your circulating nurse will escort you to the post-anesthesia recovery room. You'll spend about 30 minutes there. They'll apply some monitoring equipment and you'll hear them give a nurse-to-nurse -nurse report. Once you're settled, they will be interested in any discomfort that you may be having, anything at all that might be bothering you. Let them know. Welcome to the PACU, which is the post anesthesia care unit. We like to call it the wake up room. Here in the PACU, we will monitor your recovery for about 30 to 45 minutes. While you're recovering, we will monitor your vital signs, we'll watch for any nausea, monitor your pain, and check out your surgical site. You will be asked to perform small tasks to help with your recovery process. Your significant other or family will be notified that the procedure is over and that you are resting comfortably. After recovery room, you will be brought to the post-op room. A nurse will greet you there, take your vital signs, and help get you settled there. Safety is our top priority. A fall can be devastating for a total joint replacement patient. So because of this, fall prevention is number one. Never get up without the help of the nursing staff. Please call, don't fall. Also, use your walker for every step you take. Your walker is the insurance policy to prevent falls. Recovering from a joint replacement can be a challenge. And so our goal for you is to give you an idea of what to expect. Our hope is that by the time you leave, you will have all the resources and information you need to be confident and successful in your recovery of your new joint replacement. You will be welcomed by a registered nurse and patient care assistant. Your nurse will take your vitals and an initial assessment will be completed. Your pain level will be assessed and a mutual pain goal will be established. When you are comfortable and settled in, we'll ask you questions about your admission and what your goals are for discharge. It is during this admission assessment that your family members or visitors may be asked to wait in the unit lounge to allow for privacy until your assessment is complete. 
After your initial assessment, we will continue to closely monitor your vital signs, your pain and incision, and your recovery from anesthesia. You will have an IV, the same IV that was placed in pre-op, which we will use to give you fluids, antibiotics, and other medications needed for your care and recovery. We do want you to rest, however, it is our job to closely monitor you to make sure you are recovering well, and that requires frequent visits from your nurse and care team. Some of the number one patient questions we receive when our patients come back from recovery are, when can I eat and when can I get up? Our answers to you is that it truly depends on how you are recovering from anesthesia. Typically, our patients start on a clear liquid diet and then slowly and sometimes quickly return to the diet they were following before admission. We do have a menu that our patients can order from and a care team member will show you how to do so once cleared to eat by your doctor or nurse. As for getting you up and moving, our goal is to get you up and moving when it is safe to do so. In order to get up, you must have full feeling and movement in your lower extremities. You must always have a patient care unit staff member with you at all times. It is important that you do not get out of bed by yourself and follow important safety precautions to avoid serious additional injury. You will be seen by a physical therapist and occupational therapist prior to discharge. They will discuss the types of activities and exercises to do until your follow-up appointment. They will also assist you in determining what tools and equipment you may need upon discharge. In addition to seeing your physical therapist and occupational therapist, you will also be seen by a social worker. Your social worker will help to set up and coordinate care after discharge. Another person you will be visited by is our respiratory therapist. Our respiratory therapist may discuss coughing and deep breathing exercises and how to use a device called an incentive spirometer. These exercises, as well as being upright, are important to preventing post-op complications. Prior to discharge, your nurse will review educational materials with you. Some common topics include post-op complications and pain management. Because you've had surgery, you are at risk for developing potential complications from surgery. Some of these possible complications include developing a blood clot or a possible infection. It is important to discuss with your nurse and care team what you can do to prevent these complications, how to recognize them, and what to do if these complications should occur. Some things you can do to prevent infection include keeping your incision clean, washing your hands, and notifying your doctor of any signs and symptoms of infection. To prevent blood clots, your doctor may prescribe and send you home on a medication called an anticoagulant. This medication can help to prevent blood clots from forming. An additional way to prevent blood clots from forming is to keep your circulation moving. This can be accomplished in the hospital by wearing your SED pumps while in bed and at home by pumping your feet. Once your physician has determined that you are medically stable, which means you are able to eat and empty your bladder, you have successfully completed physical therapy, your pain is under control, and you have a safe plan for discharge, your physician will write a discharge order. Typically, this happens on the day of surgery or sometimes the day after. It is after your discharge order is placed that we will remove your IV, help you to get dressed, print your discharge information for you, and review it with you. If at any time during your stay you have a question about your care plan, feel free to ask a member of your care team. And then finally, after all questions have been answered, a nurse or nursing assistant will assist you in gathering your belongings and assist you to the exit and on to your next step in recovery. You should be familiar with rating your pain on a pain scale of 0 to 10. By rating your pain, the nurses will be able to assess the effectiveness of your pain medication and help manage your pain. Let's be realistic here. You will have pain. You are having surgery. Setting a pain goal is helpful for both patients and nurses. It is reasonable to expect that you have some discomfort while being able to participate in your cares. Setting pain goals also helps to reduce the need for narcotic pain medications. Multimodal pain management is about using several different things to help us manage pain. We usually talk about multimodal pain management being about medications. I like to start with ice elevation and rest. Be sure you're using your ice packs, elevating as instructed, and resting, meaning don't overdo it. In the hospital and at home, you will be prescribed several different medications to help with your pain. These include things like Tylenol, Celebrex, Neurontin, and steroids, and indeed opioids. More on that in a minute. By using the non-narcotic pain medications, each works in a different way, but when you put them all together, they do a great job. 
it actually helps to reduce the need for opioids or narcotics while giving you great benefit. These medications are individualized to the patient based on your own health status and needs. Your doctor will decide on discharge which medications you will need. Pain management is one of our top priorities for our patients, which is why we talk about it almost immediately when our patients arrive on the unit. It is important to discuss with your nurse a pain goal. What's the level of pain you can get up and move with, sleep with, on a scale of 0 to 10? Keep in mind that you have just had surgery and a pain low of 0 out of 10 may not be possible. Some pain should be expected, but having too much pain may be telling you that you are doing too much too soon. Everyone's pain is different, and so having a pain goal helps us get you to that tolerable level while you're here with us and when you get home. Our physicians and care team will help to guide you in your pain management. Your physician may prescribe a number of different pain medications. If you have questions, our pharmacist can help to better explain how these medications work and what side effects they may have. In addition to medications, our physicians may also prescribe the use of ice, elevation, and rest to help with pain management. Opioids are used for breakthrough pain or severe pain. They do a really good job at reducing pain. However, they do have side effects that are concerning. Among these are drowsiness, slowed breathing, nausea, vomiting, itching, difficulty passing your urine, and addiction. One of the most uncomfortable side effects is constipation, so be sure and have some stool softener in your home. Let's get back to some of the other people you'll be meeting during your hospital stay. A respiratory therapist from cardiopulmonary services will stop and visit you several times during your hospital stay. They will provide to you any breathing treatments that you need, help you with your CPAP, and give you an incentive spirometer. After surgery, when you're not moving around as much, you're taking medications and you're sleepy, you don't take big deep breaths like you normally do during your everyday life. This can lead to post-operative pneumonia. Because of this, your respiratory therapist will show you how to use the incentive spirometer to take deep breaths and clear your lungs. The incentive spirometer is your best friend for your lungs and prevention of pneumonia. This is the incentive spirometer. This is the deep breathing exerciser that will help prevent you from developing pneumonia after your surgery. We will want you to use it twice a day with the respiratory therapist and every hour on your own, 10 to 15 repetitions. Okay, Laura, this is your incentive spirometer. I have marked your goal for today that's based on your height, your age, and your gender. What I need you to do is to take the mouthpiece, put the mouthpiece in your mouth, Take a, a slow, deep breath in. Fill your lungs, hold your breath for two to three seconds. Let it out. Okay, why don't you give that a try? And take a slow, deep breath in. Fill your lungs as much as you can. Good, hold two, three, and let it out. You'll notice while you hold your breath, the white piston will fall down. That's impossible to hold it up there, so don't try to hold it up into that position. And also try to keep the yellow piston in the middle area of the clear. Good. And another one, number three. Always do five repetitions at a time, taking a short break in between. There you go. Good. Four. One more deep breath in. Good, fill them up and hold two, three, and out. Okay, well, after doing a set of five like that, we always want you to take a short break and then do another set of five. And if your volumes are a little bit low, I would definitely have you do a third set of five. Always do 10 repetitions minimally to make this a therapeutic benefit, okay? Some of the risk factors for developing pneumonia would include having a history of asthma, COPD, and having a history of pneumonia itself. You can help prevent developing pneumonia here at Memorial Medical Center by doing these deep breathing exercises called incentive spirometry. An occupational therapist will also visit with you during your hospital stay. 
the occupational therapist will review with you some tricks for how to care for yourself while at home. Physical therapy will also visit reviewing your home exercise program and walking safely with your walker. Both the occupational therapist and the physical therapist are key members of your team. After any surgery, but especially after orthopedic surgery, it is important that we discuss prevention of blood clots. Blood clots in the legs can travel to the lungs or heart and cause devastating complications. Because of this, there are several things that we do to prevent them. First, you will be given some kind of medication to thin your blood. Most often, this is aspirin, but sometimes, based on your medical history, you may have a prescription blood thinner. Maintaining activity, getting up once an hour, doing your exercises, especially your calf or foot pumps, and compression stockings can all help to prevent blood clots. In addition, while you're in the hospital, we will have a mechanical pump on your legs helping to enhance the blood circulation back up to your heart and prevent blood clots. The white compression stockings that you will be given will be on during the day and off at night. You can rinse them at night and let them hang to dry to be placed in the morning. Nutrition is important before, during, and after your hospitalization. Your body needs good nutrition to heal after surgery. It will be important to keep yourself well hydrated and provide your body with all the nutrients and building blocks to heal. Your initial diet after surgery will be clear liquid. However, we will advance your diet as you tolerate it as soon as possible. Be sure and include plenty of fruits and vegetables into your diet to prevent constipation. While in the hospital, you will be able to fill out a menu and call room service during certain hours. Your nursing staff will explain this to you. The decision to discharge you to home is a team decision between you, your family, your surgeon, social services, nursing, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. The entire team wants to know that when we discharge you, you are going to be successful and safe at home. Sometimes the discharge process can take a while. We know that you'll be eager to leave the hospital and we want to be sure everything is in place to ensure a smooth and safe transition. A nurse will review with you your discharge instructions. These instructions are specific to you. In addition, you'll be given paper prescriptions for some of your pain medications. So be prepared to stop at a pharmacy after you leave the hospital. Staff will help you get dressed and ready for discharge and escort you out to the car. Most of your medications will be sent to the pharmacy electronically. Also important to note, should you need any refills on your prescriptions, you really need to give your surgeon's office at least 48 to 72 hours notice for these refills. Once you're at home, it's important to balance activity and rest. While it's important not to overdo activity, it's also important to continue to improve your activity. A general rule is that for the first week post-op, only be up and about on your feet for 10 minutes per hour. This can be five minutes every 30 minutes or 10 minutes per hour getting up walking to the bathroom, doing what you need to do, getting a snack, and going back to rest. On week two after surgery, you can increase this to 20 minutes per hour, only if you're tolerating it. You really need to listen to your body. Activity is going to help to promote healing and prevent many complications. Some of these complications are blood clots, pneumonia, and constipation. All that said, it's easy to overdo the activity as you feel better. Try to instead focus on rest for the first two weeks and then gradually increase your activity. Constipation was mentioned earlier in our discussion on narcotics. Constipation is caused not only by 
the narcotics that we take for pain control, but also inactivity. It is easily one of our number one complaints that we get post-op. It's easy to avoid this complication if we plan for it. So I recommend that you do pick up a stool softener before surgery. Also eating a fiber rich diet, drinking plenty of water and getting up and about as instructed will help you to avoid this. Swelling, otherwise known as edema, is common after surgery, but we do need to control it. The trauma of surgery causes our tissues to swell and fluids to shift, and that's the cause of the edema. Leg elevation is the primary way to help to reduce the swelling and also reduce pain. Swelling is primarily noted for the first two weeks, but can continue on for several weeks after surgery. Keep your legs straight as you elevate. Ideally, the foot is higher than the knee, which is higher than the hip. Avoid pillows under the knees directly as this promotes blood clots. When patients do call the office with questions on swelling, we do tend to find out that they are being too active. They're not elevating their legs as instructed, and so we need to slow them down a little bit and get them to rest more. For our hip replacement patients, we do discuss hip dislocation precautions. Although hip dislocation is rare, we do want to be cautious of it, be aware of it, and avoid it at all costs. For the first several weeks after surgery, we recommend that while sitting, you don't go past a 90 degree angle. Also, never cross your legs. Bending to pick something up off the floor also brings your hip flexion less than 90 degrees. So avoid that, use a reacher instead. While walking with a walker, don't internally rotate your toes, keep your toes straight forward. And when you're resting, a pillow can help you to avoid these positions. All of these precautions are in your guidebook and physical therapy and nursing will review them with you again prior to discharge from the hospital. While in the hospital, you'll be given a cold therapy gel wrap. The wrap will hold two frozen gel packs and you will have two more gel packs that you will keep in your freezer and rotate them every four hours. Cold therapy will help shrink your vessels, help you to decrease and control your swelling and reduce pain. Never place the gel packs directly on your skin. Always use the gel pack with the wrap. When you are at home, place the gel packs in your freezer flat so they freeze completely over four hours. After four hours, take the warmed gel packs, put those in your freezer and put the frozen gel packs into the gel wrap. By doing this, you allow your skin temperature to warm back up to normal before you bring that temperature back down with the fresh packs. This cycle will help with circulation and reducing swelling. Continue using these gel packs every four hours continuously while you're awake, at least for the first two weeks after surgery. If after that time you're still getting benefit from the cold packs, definitely use it. It's yours to use. Here is a picture of the dressing that will cover your incision after surgery. It's pretty low profile, just some gauze with a plastic covering making it a waterproof dressing. It's important to leave the dressing on until your first post-op visit. As long as it's not saturated and the dressing is sealed good and tight, we want it left alone. By leaving that dressing in place, you are preventing infection.
If the edges of the plastic start peeling up, you can certainly reinforce it with some tape. A small amount of drainage on the gauze is perfectly normal. If, however, that gauze is saturated and there is pooling blood underneath the plastic, please call your surgeon's office. Because this is a waterproof dressing, you can shower when you get home. However, we don't want this dressing or your incisions submerged in any kind of water like a tub bath, at least until the incision is completely healed. Should the dressing leak and the incision get wet while in a tub bath or a hot tub or a sauna, you're introducing bacteria into the wound which will lead to an infection. Glad Press and Seal is a product that we use in our kitchens, but it can be real useful on top of a dressing as well by adding an extra layer of protection preventing water from getting into the dressing. By now, it should be clear that we are pretty concerned about infection and protecting your incision. Again, we really want that original dressing to stay in place until your two-week visit. At your two-week visit, the dressing will be removed and the provider you see will take a good look at your incision and see how it's healing. We may or may not put another dressing on your incision. Once your incision is left open to air, we really want you to just leave it alone. Please don't touch the incision. Your fingers are going to bring germs to the incision leading to infection. Don't pick at any scabs, just let them fall off on their own. The scab is protecting and healing the incision, preventing infection. Don't apply anything at all to the incision. Ointments, creams, powders, or any home remedy can cause harm to the incision, which is going to prevent it from healing. Don't scrub your wound when you're showering. Instead, gently pat with a clean washcloth and towel dry. Finally, if you have pets, Please protect your wound from your pet's scratching or licking on it. This will certainly bring harm. While at home, if you have any questions at all about your incision, please call your surgeon's office before you do anything to it. Any sign or symptom of infection is concerning. Some of these signs and symptoms are fever greater than 101 degrees Fahrenheit, yellow, pus-like drainage, swelling, redness and heat, and pain not relieved by your pain medication. If you are concerned about infection, please call your surgeon's office as soon as possible. The sooner we identify and treat an infection, the better outcome you're going to have. A common concern for patients is numbness. However, most numbness is normal, especially when you have numbness along the side of the incision or the side of the knee. However, if you have numbness going down the foot or loss of motion, this is much more concerning. Please call the office. We often get calls from patients about bruising. Please know bruising is also very normal after surgery. Surgical trauma causes bleeding into the soft tissues. This bleeding causes bruising. Bruising can be localized or extend the entire length of the leg. Bruising can be very little or it can be quite a lot. Gravity can bring bruising to unexpected areas like the foot, ankle, or knee. Bruising will also come in many colors from pink and purple to green and brown. Bruising will continue to change over time. Expect to see your bruising at least two to four weeks. Rest, elevation, and using your cold packs will help. 
Your success at home is very important to us. Our transitional care manager will call you. We want to be sure that you're doing well at home and that any questions are answered. This nurse will review your discharge instructions, answer any questions or deal with any problems that you might be having. She will also review your medications to be sure that you're taking them as instructed. Any questions or concerns will be followed up with your surgeon's office. Following up with your orthopedic team is very important and expected. Your surgeon needs to monitor your progress and guide your journey to recovery and achievement of your goals. If you don't follow through with your post-operative appointments, it's more difficult to avoid potential complications and reach these goals. Please let us know if you cannot make an appointment so we can reschedule at a more convenient time. At your two-week visit, you will see your surgeon, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. They will assess your progress with activity, function, pain control, and check your incision. This provider will review your medications, exercises, precautions, and other instructions. You may or may not start physical therapy at this time if appropriate. At your six week follow up appointment, you will have x rays before you see your surgeon. Your surgeon will evaluate your progress in activity, function, pain, healing, and your incision. Your surgeon will advise you on your plan of care. Together, you will discuss your progress towards your goals. You may or may not have more follow-up appointments based on your individual needs. Your new hip is considered fully healed at about the one year mark. For this reason, we will want to see you back in the clinic for another evaluation and x-rays. We will discuss your achievement towards your goals and look ahead to follow up every five years after that. Another mention about Welby. You will continue to receive information from Welby up to a year. Periodically, you'll be asked to fill out some questionnaires. This helps us to continually track you and see how you're doing when we're not seeing you physically in the office. These questionnaires also give us valuable data to continually improve our practice and continually improve how we care for patients. Before and after surgery, we are here for you. If you have questions, please call your surgeon's office. Thank you for joining our virtual joint replacement class. We wish you well throughout your journey and look forward to helping you get back to what you used to do. Please click on the completion button on the main orthopedic page under this presentation to receive credit for attending class.